I just read Smarter, Faster, Better by Charles Duhigg, and this is a book about motivation, experimentation, and shaking things up a little bit. So the book starts out with motivation, and he talks about this rare uh, neurological disorder. It's uh, something that happens randomly to people, whether they're in an accident or sometimes just from being in too high an altitude. Something will pop inside of their brain, and it affects a certain part of the brain, which causes them to have no motivation. So what happens when this uh, happens to someone is they'll just want to sit on the couch all day, watch TV. They could be like the most outgoing person, own a couple of companies. As soon as this happens to them, they just want to sit, watch TV all day. Now, if you tell them to do something, they'll do it. They just won't ever want to do anything of their own accord. And basically, they found that the way to cure this is by presenting these people with as many questions as possible that give them uh, choices. Usually, it's two different choices. So by causing them to have to make decisions, that basically uh, builds up their strength and their willpower. And judging by this, the theory is that by giving yourself choices um, all the time, uh, choice A, choice B, you feel like you're in control, therefore you have greater willpower. That's what all this revolves around. It's around feeling like you're in control. So they talk about Toyota and how they have an Andon cord, which is they have the Toyota moving assembly line, and then along the line there's this cord running. And if you pull the cord, it'll stop the whole line. And it costs something like $15,000 per minute uh, when the line's not moving because you just pause the whole thing. But they give each employee the power to pull the line if they feel they need to, uh, if there's any problem, and that allows them to feel like they're really in control of their job. Like, they're the frontline people, but they're making these big, huge de decisions, which could, you know, in one minute, make uh, half a year of salary uh, just be wasted, basically. And they talk about how this is good in nursing homes, too, with old people. Uh, people feel like they're not in control of their life anymore, and they're just like, they live there, and they do whatever the nursing home tells them to. And they actually end up dying sooner from that. Rather, if you are sort of the rebel in this nursing home, and you trade your food with other people even though you're not supposed to, or you just like leave your room at night when you're not supposed to, that reinforces in your brain that you're in control, and that actually causes you to be more consistent in things like taking your medicine and uh, also happiness. They talk about how this increases happiness at work too, feeling like you're in control, as well as your income. So by doing these things, you're increasing your lifespan, you're happier, um, they said all different stuff like that, uh, all tons of different benefits from making small choices, feeling like you're in control. Now, the next part, I'm going to talk about the experimentation. Now, the book then call, talks about experimentation and how you should develop hypotheses about how something works and then go and test that. And a good example from that that I liked was a debt collector. It was City's debt collection department. They had a couple different departments. I think they were spread out throughout the country. And the managers would have different styles of teaching uh, their employees how to handle calls. There's this one manager who consistently made a million dollars in extra collections over everyone else. And what she did was she looked at the very specifics so, like, she would call people only between the ages of 21 and 26 one day, and she would listen to how they talked to see if they were male or female, or to see what they were doing in the background or what time of day it is. And she would always isolate just one thing uh, every week, and that would allow her to uh, realize these super obscure connections. So, to give an example of something she found is that if you call in the morning, as you're more likely to get an answer from a woman. So if it's a family, the woman is more a, uh, willing to pay off the family's debts. Now, a really obscure one would be that if you hear a soap opera playing in the background, you're going to want to talk more softly because that yields better results. If you hear religious talk, you're going to want to be more forceful. 
Um, just the different types of people react different ways to different situations. If you're calling a working man, you want to call him around lunchtime and then be like, oh my god, I'm so, I'm so excited that I was able to catch you on your lunch break. Like, implying that they're busy and important and then they want to uh, kind of keep up that image in your mind and they're more likely to pay for that reason. Now the next thing is shaking things up a little bit. So I love this example because my favorite movie ever is Disney's Frozen, released in 2013, and it won all of these awards in 2014. It was the greatest animated movie of all time, revenue-wise and in my opinion. Uh, but I love that they gave this example. So they talked about how they had this typical Disney story in place, where they had a princess, they had a ball, and they had, uh, she had like a sidekick, and they had this evil person who wanted to hurt them, uh, they had like these monsters, and all of the typical Disney story elements that you'd expect in any princess story. And they say that they kept shaking it up, and they knew they had the right things, but they wanted something different, something new. Uh, they said it was like a puzzle, and they had all these pieces, but they just wanted to put them together in a new, unique way. Originally, Elsa was this evil queen who hated her sister Anna, and then they ended up switching that around where they're friends, but one's just misunderstood, and they explain it to be like this amazing story, which it is, you have to watch the movie, but originally it was completely different, and they kept switching things around, and in like the last year and a half, there was something like one person changed job roles, like they just changed their title, and then in their mind, they started thinking differently, and they came up with this perfect solution that just went together, and Frozen now has, I think, $1.2 or $1.3 uh, billion dollars in revenue just from the movie, plus billions in merchandise. So that was a huge success. They also talk about this in Nature. They talk about how in a rainforest, you'll have areas that have like 50 different varieties of all different plants. And then, you know, 100 yards away, you'll have just one type of plant. And someone actually went there to study why that happens. And they figured out that diversity is created when there's like a little uh, shaking up of the environment. So... In the case of the rainforest, it tended to be, say there was a wildfire in one area. That would reduce the tree line, allowing different plants on the floor to get more sunlight, and they could live there. Um, you want it just to be a little bit, though, because if it's a huge wildfire and there's no forest, no trees anywhere, you're just going to have those uh, ground floor uh, plants that feed off of the sunlight. But if you have that, and then the area next to it still has some trees, you can end up with tons of different uh, animals and plants and all these types of things. They talk about this with reefs, and they basically just say, like, shake things up a little, switch one thing around a little bit, and you'll never know what the result could be.